Um, so thank you to all of the conference organizers. It's really wonderful to be here. In 1760, Jew Abraham Mendes the Castroler a Bible from Putsumano's Publishers in Amsterdam. <clears throat> Frustrated by the lack of Spanish and Hebrew Bibles for Jewish students in Curacao, the Castro proposed printing a two-column Bible where the Hebrew and Spanish text would appear side by side. Though Hebrew and Yiddish Bibles were relatively common in the 16th century and Spanish and Ladino Bibles had been printed since 1553, this was the first Hebrew-Spanish Bible. Interestingly then, the first Hebrew book commissioned by and for an American was contracted from Curacao, a colonial Dutch trade on the Leeward Antilles. It had a very small Jewish community. The book's introduction pays homage to the Jewish leadership in Amsterdam's Talmud Torah, asserting the polytheist dependence on the Dutch mother congregation. But the Bible's production signals a significant turn in the relationship between the Dutch and Curacao and Jewish communities. One aspect of the shift is economic. The island community had become wealthy enough that it did not need to petition the Amsterdam Sephardic Jewish community leadership for aid. And some of its members could commission expensive volumes that required innovative typesetting and high level of aesthetic detail. But the bilingual Bible also reflected a deeper religious transformation. It was, after all, initiated by a member of Curacao's Sephardic congregation, Mikvah Israel, for the specific religious and pedagogic needs of the congregation, suggesting Curacao was no longer dependent upon Amsterdam for direction in such matters. Indeed, one of the arguments that I'm making is that Curacao claimed independence from its former mother congregation eventually replacing it as the mother congregation of the Americas, influencing the development of Jewish communal life in the Americas. Moreover, the pastor, in addition to gifting a copy of Curacao's Mikveh to Curacao's Mikveh Israel, printed the Bible with the explicit instructions that all profit made from the sale of the Bible be gifted to the Jewish community of Rome. This rich event serves as an introductory anecdote that highlights important, the importance of gifting and materiality in the Portuguese Jewish early modern Atlanta. By the 18th century, Curacao was the most important economic and religious center for Portuguese Jews in the Americas. Curacao's commercial status rapidly rose as more colonists settled the area that was ideal for sea trade. Trading with Spanish, French, and English holdings in the Americas by the 1660s, Curacao was a major hub of international trade with Jews as central actors. In the early 1700s, the population of Curacao boomed and the island soon gained the status of a free port. The economic success of Jews in Curacao is well known and traditionally understood as immaterial to make the Israel subservience to another congregation in Amsterdam. The communal and religious life of Curacao has been largely overlooked on the grounds that the Caribbean subservience to Amsterdam renders its religious life of little independent interest. Curacao's contribution and much scholarship lies in its roguish and stereotypically Caribbean addition of sailors and privateers to the stock of Jewish characters. The island community and its members are not to be taken seriously as religious actors in the Atlantic or as, significant, or as a significant community in terms of its theological production. But what I would argue is that through a process that is somewhat mimetic of Amsterdam's relationship with its satellite communities, and a process that also knocks the creolization of this American religious community, which is the focus of my larger project, first as Mikvah Israel rose to a position of economic su success, had a powerful and centralized Portuguese Jewish community, and assumed a position of religious authority among versioning American Jewish communities, which it performed partially through gifting. Often I focus on the Mama, the Jewish governing board, and the power that it wielded. Modeled on the Portuguese Jewish communal systems of Amsterdam, the Kurdistan Mama was most concerned with maintaining its own authority and homogenization of religious practice on the island. As Kurdistan's Jewish community became increasingly established, both in terms of its population and its peak, the, Jew, the Portuguese Jews comprised anywhere between a third to half of the island's free population. The Ma'amad, in many ways, following the earlier model of Amsterdam, sought to extend its power beyond the island's borders. Just as Amsterdam transferred religious objects, personnel, and money to form new Portuguese Jewish communities, Curacao's Mikveh Israel likewise used the same me method to affirm its centrality and assert its power. A primary vehicle to see this process is through the transfer of gifts both money and ritual objects. Curacao began to replace Amsterdam as an American center by aiding new and less fortunate Portuguese Jewish communities in the Americas. It helped them acquire ritual objects and build religious spaces. This had previously been Amsterdam's role. In fact, Amsterdam did this for Curacao as well. 
Just as Amsterdam's common tourists sent two shipments of assorted religious ceremonial objects to Barbados in 1657, and a tourist scroll with an expensive black and silk silver announced to St. Eustatius in 1738. By the beginning of the 18th century, McVisual sent ritual objects and funds to these communities as well. The communities on both islands were deeply tied to Curacao through commerce and family, much as Curacao had been to Amsterdam. Under the command of the West India Company, the free port of St. Eustatius became a hub for both legal and illicit colonial trade. Portuguese Jews, many with ties to Curacao, moved to the island in droves looking to expand their trade networks. This connection made St. Eustatius a frequent recipient of aid from Curacao. Later disputes between Ashkenazim and Sephardim and St. Eustatius led the Sephardim to seek economic relief from Curacao's Israel in 1761. Goodwill offerings were made and additional money was contributed from the community chest. In 1772, a hurricane destroyed the island's synagogue, causing the Israel to once again contribute to its rebuilding. In addition to di direct financial assistance in 1750, 1752, and 1770, St. Eustatius relied on Curacao to repair its tourist scrolls. Curacao's financial aid extended beyond the Caribbean as the island played an integral role in establishing the earliest communities in North America as well. In 1729, New York shared Israel after years of meeting in rented quarters began construction of its first building, which would be known as the Mill Street Synagogue. At this time, Rabbi Jeshurun and Curacao received a letter from Sherid Israel's leadership requesting that, quote, the members of your holy kahal may, community may contribute all they can to the building of a holy synagogue so that the congregation would not have to continue congregating in a synagogue rented, rented from a goy, a nunchu. Khan Jeshron organized the fundraising drive in 1729, despite the fact that Israel had raised funds for their own building only a year earlier. This resulted in the largest donation of any outside of the congregation itself. At a later 1730 receipt enumerates the funds that New York Sherry Israel received from Kursa's Mikvah Israel. The successful fundraising effort on behalf of Sherry Israel reflects both the general practice of aiding other congregations in the Americas and the ties between Kursa and the New York Synagogue. The rabbi Kazan Sherry Israel during this period was Moses Lopez de Fenesta, son of Curacao's Pajam Lopez. Lopez de Fenesta served the New York congregation since the 1720s and was not the first Curacao to do so. Sal Carlos, son of Pajam Josiah Pardo, was the first known Kazan Sherry Israel in 1685. In the early 1760s, the Newport, Rhode Island community appealed to various congregations to construct their synagogue, among them Miss Marks in London. Though considered the mother congregation of the British Caribbean, Bevis Marks was unable to procure funds. Most of Jacob DeFranco of Bevis Marks wrote to the Newport congregation, quote, we praise you very much, but at the present time it would not be convenient for us, nor are we able to comply with the request. May God be the one who assists all, and of those who grace, who would desire that we give to you, as he is able and may be prosper in your pious plans. Ironically, the London congregation sent the Newport congregation ornamental charity boxes. The funds for the synagogue, however, were drawn primarily from American congregations such as Curacao in New York. Following the construction of the synagogue in 1764, a plea for financial help to pay the mortgage and interest, the Newport congregation appealed to the regional powerhouse, Curacao. Curacao again complied as they would again in 1768. In the early 1780s, Philadelphia's Mick Israel found itself in need of a larger synagogue. Joining Philadelphia's small extant community, their new Hazan, Christian Minnesotas, implemented the Spanish Portuguese Rite and was instrumental in the community's growth and development. One undertaking was the construction of a new building to house the congregation. In 1782, under its tutelage, Philadelphia's Mikvah Israel, quote, appealed to the Jews of the West Indies for financial help on the occasion of the erection of the first synagogue building in that city. Curacao aided by sending money. Mikvah Israel showed its generosity with contributions to communities throughout the Americas, which continued through the 19th and into the 20th century. With money being sent to Charleston, New York, Rockets, St. Thomas, uh, Venezuela, Jamaica, Suriname, and Panama, among others. Of course, charitable donations in and of themselves do not signify religious patronage. However, in these cases, the transaction was not merely financial, but rather an opportunity for Curacao to exert religious influence on its sister congregations. The relationship between the receiving community and Curacao was generally recognized through prayer or gifts. For example, New York Charity Israel Congregation recites special prayers twice a year for the health and success of Mikvah Israel. The 1729 Mikvah Israel gift to New York Charity Israel was made on the condition that, quote, ritual, that the ritual and the custom of the synagogue should always remain Sephardic. This letter from Paham Jeshurun further stipulates, quote, in accordance with the donor's wishes, 
is that the Ashkenazi members should not have any more votes nor authority than they have hitherto and for the performance of which you are to get them to sign an agreement of the same by all of them, quote, end quote, thereby ensuring that the rapidly growing number of Ashkenazi Jews do not have more votes or representation than the Sephardic members. To make certain that they would fulfill both of these conditions, Chacham Jeshron instructed to send that, they, that New York's congregation sent him a copy of their communal minutes. The first condition, that of the retention of Sephardic right, was not only a typical demand by Curacao, but was a replica of an earlier Amsterdam condition. The second condition is more unusual as it bespeaks intimate knowledge of the demographics of the New York community and the concomitant fear that the necessary inclusion of not Sephardic Jews into communal life may risk the future of Sephardic traditions in the Americas, especially those dictated by, uh, by Curacao. It wasn't enough to demand that the Sephardic custom be retained, but the Sephardic empowerment as well. This isn't an isolated case, as if Israel leadership also demanded of the Newport, now Toro Synagogue, uh, that it maintained the Sephardic right. Further, the congregation was to recognize the patronage of the island community each year on Yom Kippur. Likewise, Mikveh Israel's rising prominence and strong leadership allowed his Hachamim to exert influence on other American congregations. This was especially true under the leadership of Hachamim Mendes de Sola, who tried to regulate the kosher meat trade between Curacao, Jamaica, and New York. In 1753, the Sola even went so far as to address his concerns about the level of observance of kosher slaughtering and tagging in New York's Sherry Israel community. In 1753, letter to the leadership of that congregation, he addresses the status of the kosher meat shipped to the island of New York. The Sola informs the recipients that he has, quote, made an announcement that the meats which come from your place, New York, without a certificate of the Hazan and without your prescribed bread shall be considered prohibited. He decided this from because from what he has, quote, been able to ascertain from some Jews from your place who have sold said meat, your Hazan neither sees the meat nor knows whether it has been properly or improperly killed, and your supervisor, your shomer, in order to have it passed or for his own profit, pretends that the said Hazan has duly signed the certificates. The soul then instructs the recipients as to the supervision of kosher slaughtering, and even asserts that, quote, at different times, pieces of pork have been found in some of the casts of macro coming from your place. The cursed Adam rabbi assumed respons the responsibility of addressing the proper implementation of Jewish dietary laws and ritual slaughtering. His letter was written with a tone of religious authority and with disdain for the perceived laxity found in New York. Here we see the transition of Curacao to an authoritative religious center in the Americas, serving Portuguese Jewish communities in much the same manner as Amsterdam had. Throughout the course of the 18th century, Curacao's Nick Israel began to replace Amsterdam's Talmud and number barriers, the transfer of money ritual objects, the funds, and funds to newer alien communities. A sense of authority is demonstrated through the regulation of kosher meat and ritual supervision. And finally, demands for patronage for America's congregations. That the European mother congregation could not fund the American community and funds came from Curacao, New York, signals a shift in status, wealth, and power to the Americas. The power between the Israel and Amsterdam continues as the American congregation sought to participate and influence the global Portuguese Jewish community as well, much as its predecessors have. I can't go through the whole list because of time, but there are many more examples of such shifting both on communal and individual level. This list is in no way comprehensive. But what is important for me is how these gifts are understood. These have generally been understood through a prism of either a natural extension of diaspora consciousness or the aid that Jewish communities provided to one another. What I'm suggesting is that there's something much more significant going on. That by focusing on theories of materiality and gifting, a more powerful dynamic is revealed. Perhaps one that is also applicable to interrogating other American religious communities during the period. Further, by focusing on the materiality, questions and issues of belief and religious practice are better addressed. For the past couple of decades, there's been a move to examine the materiality of religion. In many ways, people like David Morgan argue that by interrogating the stuff of religion, ritual objects, spaces, we have another avenue of understanding one of the categories most associated, but most difficult to interrogate in religious studies, belief. And this was raised in last night's wonderful lecture as well. Materiality is a compelling register in which to examine belief because Felling, acting, interacting, and sensation embody human relations to the powers whose invocation structures social life. Most believers live their religion in, quote, the grit and strain of a felt life that embodies their relation to the divine as well as to one another. 
Further, for the purposes of this project, my project, materiality provides the opportunity to focus on the relationship between Atlantic world Portuguese Jewish communities and the dynamics of power that are associated with gifting. In terms of the area of the first category, belief, in some ways, in some regard, um, sorry, in some ways, materiality alleviates some of the imperial nature of the study of religion, especially in regards to Portuguese Jews and conversos. A question that often emerges in regards to this community, but one which is more fully thrust upon the communities in the Caribbean due to biases in general, is what did Caribbean Jew Portuguese Jews really believe? How Jewish were they? Were they theologically engaged, and more crassly, as some have put it, were they really Jews? How Jewish were they, whatever that actually means? And with a focus towards gifting and material, Curaçao's Portuguese Jewish community can be examined just like any other. Thus, the Curaçao and Portuguese Jewish communities lived religious practice, which encompasses belief, practice, performance, can better be understood as various aspects of the articulation of religious identity, community, and belief. In terms of my second suggestion, that these gifts serve as a means of establishing power, the gifting of various ritual objects falls very clearly within the realm of Mouse's theory of gifts. For Mouse, gifts do only satisfy material needs, here think the new Jewish community that needs a Torah scroll, but also strengthens social bonds. The gift for Mouse had to appear, quote, disinterested and free, though in fact it was part of a threefold obligation to give, to receive, and to repay. For Curtis as with Israel, repayment was in the form of homage, centralization of power, and the recognition of patronage. If we look at later theories such as those put forward by Helmut Birking or Pierre Bordeaux, this argument is further supported. Birking, who builds upon Gregory's ideas of commodities and gifts, focuses on the relational significance of gifting. Quote, if brothers make gifts, then gifts make brothers. Bordeaux, in terms of gift exchange, argues, quote, there has to be a collectivity maintained and a proof of self-deception with which symbolic exchange of fake circulation of fake use could not operate. Meaning that the gift has to conceal its self-interest within an envelope that mystifies its efficacy for the participants in the exchange. This is not to deny the importance of the transaction, properly conducted with the affirmation of approved and accepted symbols. It can possess great effective power. Finally, what I'm, going to, what I'm suggesting is that if we look more closely at these gifts, and the context within which they are given, three things are brought to the fore. First, the Curacao utilized the act of gifting in a deliberate manner as a form of exerted, exerting religious control and establishing itself as the mother congregation of the Americas. Second, that these gifts are a means to more deeply understand the religious identity and the religious networks that existed throughout the Portuguese Jewish Atlantic. In essence, they are performances of religious identity and practice. And third, if we understand these gifts within various theoretical frameworks, understanding that the meaning of the gift and materiality is dynamic and changes within various societies and periods, the value in further theorizing these gifts and not understanding them as simply a natural extension of Jewish brotherhood or the Portuguese Jewish diaspora consciousness, then the process of giving, the effective relationship between the actors and the nature of the material separated from the category of a normal commodity and separated from regular exchange, helps determine the nature of the gifted object, its donation, and its value in terms of its social contract and issues of power and identity.